Hello students, welcome to MEC 1321 Engineering Statics. I'm Dr. Stewart, and today we're going to go over sections 3. Point, I mean uh, sections 6.3 and 6.4 from the book. In the previous video we went over 6.1 and 6.2, and we learned about the basics of structural analysis. We learned about simple trusses, complex trusses, as well as how to use the method of joints in order to determine the internal forces in these in, in the members of a truss. Today we're going to learn about uh, in section 6.3 zero force members and in section 6.4 we're going to learn the method of sections which is uh, a, fairly, a fairly useful method in, in order to learn the internal forces within a truss system. So let's go ahead and get started with section 6.3, zero force members. Um, now, when we're designing trusses or when we're analyzing trusses and statics, we focus on truss systems that do not have uh, additional members that do not support load. However, when a bridge is designed, often zero force members, so members that do not support load, are incorporated into bridge designs. Um, there is a number of reasons why zero force members are added. Um, one of the reasons is that they can increase stability during construction. So while you're building a bridge, it, it makes uh, a more stable platform while the bridge construction is going on. But also, the zero force member can add can be can act as an additional support that only becomes active when there is some kind of failure mode that happens in a bridge. So say the zero force member is not supposed to be in tension, but the bridge has been in use for 50 years and the primary load bearing uh, uh, truss uh, has failed. And so a zero force member uh, becomes under load. Now in general, when we're doing problems here in statics, we want to identify those zero force members and eliminate them from our analysis. Uh, and when we do not eliminate zero force members from our analysis, sometimes what it can do is it can prevent us from being able to actually use our equations of equilibrium, use the method of joints, or use the method of sections in order to solve a problem. Because we end up with too many unknowns and not enough of, of equations. So there are two methods that we can use in order to identify zero force members. One is the two member rule. The two member rule states if there are two members that form a truss and no external load and no external load or support support reaction is applied to the joint then the two members must be zero force members. So think of it as two members there there's no support reaction so there's no support where they where they meet at the joint and there is no external load applied to that joint. When we think about that um, and then we apply equations of equilibrium, we can readily identify that, that those two members are going to be zero force members. And so an example is given here in this figure where we have an interesting truss system and you, applying that two member rule we can look at, at point A as well as point B. We see that at the joint there is no, it's a, there's two members, there is no support reaction that develops and there are no external forces applied at point at, at uh, joint A or at joint D. When we actually apply the equations of e equilibrium at these joints we find that there are no forces uh, that are acting at that joint and thus the members uh, that are connected at that joint are zero force members. So we can very simply uh, uh, redraw or, or uh, redescribe the geometry as thus, removing those zero force members. Now let's look at the second method uh, which can be used which is the three member rule. If three members form a truss joint for which two of the members are collinear, meaning they are parallel to each other, they, they have the same line of action and are parallel, the third member is a zero force member provided that there is no external force or support reaction applied at the joint. So what we have to think about is there are three members, they meet at a single joint. Two of those members 
have the same line of action and are parallel to each other. So they form a single line. And there is a third member that intersects that line at the joint. If there is no external force or support reaction, no matter what angle is between those three, between the, the collinear uh, members in the singular third member, if, there is no, if there's no external force or support reaction, then the third member is a zero force member. Okay? So let's look at this example we have here where we have a geometry. Um, and if we look at that geometry closely, we see that there are two joints where we have three, where we have three members, um, where two of those members are collinear. So at joint D, there's, there's a line that is formed by two members, and then there is uh, the third member coming out at 90 degrees. And then at point C, there is a line that's created by two members, and there is a third member that comes out at some angle theta. Doesn't matter what angle it is, some angle theta. When we look closely at each of these joints and we use the method of joints to try to solve them, we'll find that the third member, uh, th that when we sum the forces, the third member is a zero force member. Because there's no external force or, or support reaction, clearly the third member is going to be a zero, a zero force member. Um, and we can do the same thing for joint C and D. And when we do that, we identify that zero force member and we remove it from the geometry, our geometry is simplified to thus, where all the zero force members are eliminated. Now let's look at the method of sections. Now previously we, we learned the method of joints. And the method of joints stated that we could apply the equations of equilibrium at various joints or at individual joints uh, that, that connect a truss system. In the method of sections, what we're going to do is instead of segmenting and, and applying the equations of equilibrium to individual joints, we're going to section a geometry and apply the equations of equilibrium to sections. So the method of joints states that if a truss is in equilibrium, then any segment of that truss is also in equilibrium. So say we're given a bar that is put under tension. If we were to take that bar and section it by drawing a line through it, so drawing a section through it, and separate what's on the top and on the bottom into individual sections, then when we, then when we apply the equations of equilibrium, we should maintain equilibrium. So initially the bar is in equilibrium under tension. We separate it into individual segments and those individual segments should also remain in equilibrium. Um, we can also do this for problems that are under compression. So say we have a bar that's under compression. If we were to take that bar and segment it into two pieces, uh, each piece would maintain an equilibrium state. Okay, And we can very easily see that if we were to take these two sections and try to put them back together, that these internal forces that we describe, the internal compression, the internal tension, will disappear and will return back to our combined uh, d d uh, drawing. This same technique can be used on complex trusses. Uh, and for example, let's look at the falling diagram, where we have this very interesting truss system, and we have some section line A, which describes a section that we could cut through this truss. Um, we can very simply take that, take the uh, left-hand side and the right-hand side, and apply our equations equal of equilibrium for either side of the section. And we will find equilibrium. There is a state of equilibrium for each side of the section. Okay? So once we perform this, once we section and separate the left-hand and the right-hand side, we can apply our equations of equilibrium, the sum of the forces in the x some of the forces in the y, and the sum of the moments about point O, right? Now, when we're performing a section, the identification of point O is very critical. Uh, choosing a point about which to calculate uh, the, the moments is very critical, where we should select a point O where most of the unknowns cancel out. 
meaning most of those internal forces that we don't know cancel out. So for instance, this the left-hand side of this problem, I would choose a point O here. Well, I would choose point O. Let me change the color here. I would choose point O to be either G or C. And I would do that because the forces, the line of action of, of, of two forces go through G, two of the internal forces that we don't know, as well as the line of action of two of the internal forces go through point C. So either of those points would simplify our determination of the unknowns. Meaning, if we were to use point G, then FG, uh, FGC and FGF would not appear in our moment equation, and the only unknown that would appear would be FBC. If we were to use point C, then FBC and FGC would not appear in our moment equation, and the only unknown that would appear would be FGF. Okay? So it's very important when we choose where we want to, what point we want to determine that uh, equilibrium moment uh, to be at, that we choose a point where multiple unknowns uh, can be canceled out. The same thing can be done uh, on the right hand side where we can either choose point C again or point G. Okay, So these are very usually useful methods in order for us to to solve problems. Additionally, um, we can decide which section we want to use. We could either use the left hand side to find the internal forces or the right hand side to find the internal forces. Now, if we were to look at this diagram, we look at the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we can see very easily that the left-hand side has, on, has no additional unknowns. All we have is an external applied load of 1,000 newtons. If we were to use the, the right-hand side, then we would have to find our support reactions first. So we'd have to find dy, dx, and ex before we're able to find or determine those internal forces. So it's very important when you do apply the method of sections to think carefully about which section you want to use in order to determine the internal forces. Now, determining the sense, the sense rules. When in doubt, always assume that the unknown forces, the unknown internal forces, are in tension. Um, by doing this, uh, when we assume that they're in tension, we apply our equations of equilibrium. When we solve, if the value of that internal force, the unknown internal force, is positive, then our assumption is correct and it is in tension. However, if the final value is a negative, then we know that our internal force is under compression. Now, sometimes what you can do is use an inspection method, where by simply applying or thinking about how you would apply your equations of equilibrium, such as your sum of moment equation, you can identify whether, whether the remaining internal forces should be in tension or compression, right? When you do use that inspection method, you just need to be very careful in uh, identifying you, you, through inspection uh, what would maintain an equilibrium state uh, uh, with, with what, what uh, sense would maintain an equilibrium state uh, um, through the variables with, before you apply uh, your, your your, your values, meaning your, your actual quantities. Um, so we will, in our examples, when we do in class, go over uh, the method of how to actually use inspection in order to determine what should be a positive and what should be a negative sense. However, when you are in doubt, or if you don't understand the methodology, always assume tension. If it's positive, it's tension. If the final answer is negative, then it's compression. So now let's kind of go into the procedure for analysis uh, using the method of sections. The first thing we want to do is craft our free body diagram. We want to clearly label um, the, the geometry, including the, 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 the dimensions, the angular information we're given, our knowns as well as our unknowns. We want to free the body, remove the support reaction, I mean, re remove the supports and replace them with the support reactions. Once we've done that, then we need to identify where we would like to make our section, where we would like to cut through this truss in order to determine the internal forces. And we should select our section based on what internal forces we desire to find. Um, uh, in some cases, uh, before you uh, 
apply the section. So at, before you actually take your free body diagram and it's separated into two free body diagrams for each section, it may be necessary for you to actually uh, do the equilibrium for the entire geometry in order to find the support reactions. Right? Um, however, I suggest that you very closely look at your two sections and see if one of your sections does not have support reactions and is only full of the given external loads. If you have a problem where you're where you where it's only where you only have the given external loads and there are no support reactions in it, then you can go ahead and move forward without having to do that first step. Uh, once you've done that, draw the free body diagram for that section of interest and then attempt to apply the method of sections, which is applying your equations of equilibrium, right? Now, when you're trying to apply those equations of equilibrium, you need to identify uh, what is the sense of those unknown internal forces that have been exposed via the section. Um, you can either use uh, the inspection method, where we look closely and identify through inspection what should be the, the positive sense, should, should it be under tension or compression, or when in doubt, we can assume that all of the uh, members, that all of the uh, internal forces that develop in those members are under tension, and then at the end, find out if they're tension or compression. Once we've done that, apply our equations of equilibrium, uh, find out if, make sure that we have the right number of equations for the number of knowns, uh, and then solve uh, for our unknown equations. Now sometimes it'll be necessary for us to use some of the alternative form of equations of equilibrium. And we reviewed that in section 5.3 of the book, where we showed three different methods or three different sets of equations of equilibrium which could be used. The first approach, which is a classic approach, is the approach where we do the, we use the sum of the forces in the x, the y, and the moment about O equal to zero. So we have two force equations in the x and the y direction, and a single moment equation uh, that where we choose where point O is a point of our choosing. Another method is to use the two moment two moment equations, which are equations where we use two uh, sum of moment equations and one force equation uh, as our equilibrium, as our three equilibrium equations. In the case of these, uh, using the two moment rule, it requires that a line passing through A and B is not parallel to the y axis. So we cannot choose two points that are parallel to the y axis when we're using the two moment uh, uh, set of equations. There is also the three moment set of equations where we use three moments calculated at three different points in the geometry as our equations of equilibrium. When we're using these equations, it requires that the points A, B, and C not have the same line of action, meaning that you cannot form a straight line of A, B, and C, okay? You cannot draw a straight line directly through A, B, and C. Um, so these are some alternative sets of equations of equilibrium which can be used to solve some of these uh, method of section problems. In general, you can use any of these three sets of equations in order to solve method of section problems. Typically, you're going to use a classic set of equations. Typically, you're going to use the classic set of equations. However, sometimes it will be advantageous for you to use the two moment or the three moment sets of equations. And it will be up to your discretion on whether to use those alternative sets or not. And so that pretty much covers the material for today. Uh, uh, the zero force members and the method of sections. It's very important for you to review your text, uh, which covers quite a few more details on these particular topics than I do in this video. Um, Outside of that, make sure that you attempt to do some of the example problems from the book as well as the fundamental and some of the basic homework problems from the book. Um, by doing that, you'll become more familiar with actually applying uh, these techniques towards solving problems. Um, also, make sure that you're prepared for the in-class quiz. Um, that's pretty much the material for today. 
Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm Dr. Stewart, and see you in the next video.